So, I, good morning, everybody. I've been asked to speak today about the perils of prenups. And what I'm going to be talking about is, is a mixture about prenuptial agreements and whether they're good or bad and what the effects are when you need them and when you don't. And so this is primarily the psychosocial dynamics and legal effects of asking for a prenuptial agreement. As you all know, I am, I am a matrimonial a family law lawyer. I take really good care of my clients, but let's, let's move on. So prenuptial agreements, most people understand that prenuptial agreements can have a bad effect on the relationship. Nevertheless, even though people know this, more and more people are getting prenuptial agreements. The question is, is this a good idea? Is this good to do? Or is it more harmful than helpful? And oftentimes people don't realize that the prenuptial agreements often produce no benefit. So the question is, is the cost, is the risk, is the damage that it does, is it worth is it worth incurring that damage in order to get a prenuptial agreement? So we have to take a look at what is the purpose of a prenuptial agreement, what does it do, and what's the effect? So let's first start with New York law. In New York law, anything you own before you were married is yours. Anything the other spouse earned before they were married is, is it belongs to the other spouse. And then after they get married, whatever they, they earn, whatever they acquire after the marriage, typically in broad brush strokes, is marital property. So the, and, and even upon divorce, a court doesn't have the right or the authority to invade, to invade separate property in order to give it to the other spouse. So the question really becomes, when somebody asks for a prenup, you say, okay, what part of that equation do you want to change? And how do you, how do you want change that equation without seeming like a jerk? So again, when they get divorced, he gets his separate property, she gets her separate property, Whatever they got during the marriage gets divided among them equitably, and, and that's a whole issue. And so that seems to be fair. That's what most people expect. Most pe many people think that they need a prenup to get that result. That is not true. In New York State, you get that result even without a prenup, okay? Then we have, what if the one person takes some of a separate property and he puts it in, into the marital pot? Well, that's called co-mingling, and the moment you co-mingle property, then it becomes marital property. The assumption is that if you take money and you put it into the marital or bank account in both names, that you intended to give the other spouse one half of that property. Now, again, a prenup doesn't help you in that because most prenups say that if you take money and you put it into the other into an account in both in both spouses' names, that that becomes marital anyway. So again, the prenup usually doesn't change that. Okay. Now, if they buy a house. If they buy a house and one party takes some of his separate property to buy the house in New York, you get what we call an origination credit. So if husband takes $100,000 of his, of his separate property and he buys a house and he puts that as part of the deposit on the house, if they ever sell the house upon divorce, he gets an origination credit for that 100000 and then they split the rest of it equally yeah, or equitably. And so, again, the question becomes, what do you want to change? Now, a little caveat here, this origination credit applies only to real estate. So if you put separate property assets into real estate, you can get an origination credit. Do not co-mingle separate property in a marriage unless you intend to, to make a gift of that to your spouse. So the, the people handle this. So again, we don't need, we don't need a prenup to accomplish this. And most people would think that this is fair. Most people, when they get into marriage, expect that to be the result. So what do they want to change? So there are different ways of handling it. One spouse decides, hey, instead of a prenup, we'll just label everything. We'll put stickers on everything we own. So, so that's one way of doing it. The prob now, some of the problems that a prenup does is that it's, it's like making a bet on a futures market. You're betting now that you're going to get. When you sign a prenup, so here, here's, here's the fundamental problem. When people get divorced without a prenup, it's up to the judge to decide what is fair and equitable at the time that they get divorced. If they write a prenup, then that goes out the window. We no longer look to see what is fair and equitable when they get divorced, but whatever they decided before they got married. Hopefully that's 20, 30, 40 years before they get divorced. Who knows what's going to happen? So while the entire world moves on, the society, the mores of society change, the values of society change, you're stuck in that prenup. 
and you're bound to it. And a judge generally won't have the right to do what's right for you. So the question is, is that risk worthwhile? Do you want to lock yourself in to do that? Now, sometimes people make sacrifices. They didn't intend to make sacrifices. And so, but if there's a prenup that says you get nothing, you still get nothing even for those sacrifices. So once you're locked in, you're locked in. And even though life changes in between over 30, 40 years invariably, life is going to throw you curveballs and monkey wrenches. But, you know, too bad, so sad, you lock yourself in and that becomes permanent for you. What I'm most afraid of is what I call uh, lovingly the pretty woman syndrome, where he picks her up on it. If you remember that movie by that name, where the Richard Gere character picks up um, the what's her name character and, and takes her, picks her up off of a street corner, gets her accustomed to the good life. And when he's done with her, whether in the movie or euphemistically tells her, what street corner should I drop you off at? And he goes, well, I go back to where she was. I didn't do anything. But the answer is you did do something. You got her accustomed to an entirely different lifestyle. So what's fair at that point in time? Well, if, if it's locked in, it's locked in. And so that's scary because what if a woman is a victim of emotional or domestic violence, but the prenup says if she, if she walks out, she gets nothing. So that might keep somebody locked into an intolerable situation, a dangerous situation, but they have to do. On the other hand, it may, it may disadvantage the other spouse. In other words, we don't know what society becomes. Somebody gets into a prenup thinking he's got a lot of money and he could pay her. That doesn't always end up to be the case. But once there's a prenup and there's an obligation, the judge doesn't look at what's fair and reasonable to you now. If there's a prenup, you're stuck to it. What if you can't pay it? So how do we do this? So one prenup and, and one New Yorker cartoon, last section of the prenup says, no matter what happens, neither party will blab about it on Donahue because we don't want to change. So now you have certain other problems with asking for a prenup. Inherently, asking for a prenup damages a party's relationship. Like the Pandora's box, there are certain words that once uttered can never be pulled back. For example, if a man tells his woman, I don't find you sexy, I don't find you attractive, he can do penance for it for 40 years. That's always running around in her brain. If a woman tells a man, you don't satisfy me in bed, next 40 years, they can stay together happily married. For the next 40 years, he's wondering, was that good that I satisfied her? I once learned that the same thing is true for the D divorce word. Once that's uttered by one spouse, no matter how many times they pull it back, no matter how many times they say, I didn't mean it, no matter how many times they assure the other spouse that they're committed to the relationship, once it's verbalized, once it's set out there, they can never be let go. And so it always runs around in the back of the mind of the other spouse and even of that spouse. So the moment that's done, it, it can't ever be taken back. And inherently, at a time when the party should be working together to join a unified force to become to become to get to come together as a singular family, now they've both put on guard and they've mm -hmm. thrust into the roles of adversaries where now they're before they're even married, they have to think, okay, when we get divorced, what do we get? Which is inherently an adversarial role, and it's me against you. And the question is, is that a good idea? Is that a good idea to change the dynamic when they're each telling the other how much they love each other and how much they want to stay together and how much they want to live together to now to say, wait, 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 what if it doesn't work out? How do I, how do, I do this? And it often can't come back and like a self-fulfilling prophecy, it makes what you're most afraid of come true or it helps it come true. So... We know that all marriages end in one of two ways, invariably. This is sort of, uh, this, is, this is dark, but every marriage en ends either in death or in divorce. Nevertheless, most people decide not to talk about it. Most people don't draft wills. They don't talk about the end. There's, there's a quality. Sometimes we humans are happier living through something without actually articulating what we're saying. So now there's another, there's another huge problem with asking for a prenup, and that is, I, I tell people, you're going to reveal more about yourself than perhaps you intend. So the other side is going to see what are you like when you don't get what you want? Do you negotiate in a fair way? Do you get angry? How do you behave when you get angry? One woman at a seminar I gave said, 
well, maybe that's a good reason to ask for a prenup. Let me see what he's really like before we get married. That may, though, be a stress test that none of us could survive. Perhaps it's not worth putting a relationship through such a stress test just to see what the other person is like. So, as, 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 as one New Yorker cartoon says, we finally hashed out the prenup, but I'm never going to speak to him again. And so that, 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 that too often happens and that becomes. Now, one of the big problems with the prenup is if they earn as mine, whatever you earn as yours, and that's it, we never join finances. But if you do that, then all you've done is you've gotten yourself a roommate. You've never created a, 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 a joint entity of you and your spouse. Instead, you now have a roommate with a superficial relationship. Another problem with prenups is that marriages take a lot of hard work and you're going to sweat a lot and you're going to have to overcome. And the problem is that if you have a prenup that makes divorce seem really, really easy, that may make the divorce option seem too simple and people will jump out of it without doing the really hard work to make marriages work. And so the marriage will say they don't actually join forces. So generally, generally uh, prenups are very dangerous. There are times, however, when prenups are, are, are required. When, for example, if the parties have an unconventional marriage in the Scandinavian countries, they believe very much in equality. If I pay the airfare, you pay the hotels. There's no such thing as post-marital support. And so if you have an unconventional marriage, if you want to enter into an unconventional marriage, you might need a prenup. If you know that your spouse is going to be making sacrifice, if your job is leaving a career and leaving, uh, and leaving opportunities in order to do that, you may, in order to get married, you may want to protect your spouse and put in a, a prenuptial agreement not to, not to hurt the other side and protect yourself, but a prenuptial agreement to protect the other spouse and to make sure that they get at least a certain amount. And so um, the, the New Yorker cartoon saying, it's further agreed that the bride shall retain her name and her southern drawl. That's, uh, that, that'll be really important. We have another issue. What if it's a second marriage and you want to protect children from a first marriage? Now, if, the, if parties get married without a prenup, a spouse has a right of election. The spouse, you can't cut a spouse out from your estate. And a spouse gets at least 30%. And if you don't have a will, 50% of your entire estate. So whether you like it or not, this was done to protect spouses. Now, what if you have children from a prior marriage? What if you have a house? What if you intend your house to go to the other children? And it's more than a third of, and it's more than 70, 66% of your estate. Your spouse has to sign a prenup in order to, uh, in order to give, to leave, to have an estate plan and leave more than, than, than uh, the 70, 66% to your to, your other, to the other people. So then you might need a prenup. Then of course you have cases where there's a lot of family money and where there's family money and they want to protect it and keep it in the family, then of course you need a prenup to protect them. And so that, that might be, but um, it, it, again, okay. So you have the family insisting on it and then that of course creates the problems that we spoke about, but they may still insist on getting a prenup. And of course, if you have an estate plan and you want to make sure that your estate plan survives, if, if the other spouse may survive yours and you want to make sure that where your estate goes is predetermined, if your spouse inherits it, she can do whatever she wants. If she inherits one third, she can do whatever she wants with that one third. So you might need a qualified terminal, uh, terminal interest uh, property trust, a Q-tip trust, in order to make sure that the estate plan is taken care of. Okay. If you might be moving to, this, to a state which allows the courts to invade personal property, that might be another reason why you might need a prenup. And of course, the big issue is appreciation of premarital assets. So if one spouse has a business and the business is worth X, and at the end of the marriage, it's worth five or 10 times X, the other spouse has a claim to the appreciation of that business. The problem with that is how do we deal with that in a fair way? If we just cut the other spouse from any interest in that, 
pre, in that separate property, though the spouse knows that they're not a full partner in it. So we have to come up with a good way of dealing with that so that the other spouse doesn't feel that they're excluded from some portion of the, of the, of the business. Sometimes you might need a prenup because your partners insist on having a prenup. Many businesses have what are known as key man insurance, where you make sure in case your partner dies, you get an insurance, you, the, the company gets an insurance policy payout so that the insurance policy buys out the widow from the, that partner's interest. Because no partner wants to be a partner. They want, if my partner wants to be a partner with me, my partner does not necessarily want to be a partner with my widow. Now, the only thing worse than being a partner with somebody's widow is being a partner with somebody's ex-wife. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that you can't have, uh, you can't buy an insurance policy for divorce. And so the question becomes, how do we set up a good scheme to allow the business to buy out the partner's interest from an ex-wife? And so uh, that, that becomes an issue that we need to think about. And of course, if one party comes into the marriage with a lot of premarital debt, generally speaking, when parties get divorced, it, you can't do a, a reckoning. It's not an accounting sheet of everything you've done in the marriage. Well, I paid for that dinner and you paid for that for that vacation. Judges are not going to redo all of the marriage and, and sort of pay people back. Whatever you spent during marriage is spent during marriage. So if somebody comes in with premarital debt, you might want to have an agreement that deals with that premarital debt so that because there, there may not be another way. So we might need a prenup for that. And finally, the last reason that you may want a prenup and possibly the only good one is when your fiance is so afraid of getting married that they need the prenup to give them the feeling of safety for them to get married. In that case, the prenup doesn't destroy the marriage, but the prenup makes the marriage possible. And so, Knowing that prenups are very, very dangerous, but that sometimes people need prenups, how do we navigate this? And so this becomes an issue where, you, where, where not many people know this, but I argue that let's use prenups not as a divorce planning tool, but as a marriage planning tool. Let's understand what do you expect to gain in the marriage? What do you expect? How do you expect the marriage to go on? So you can put a whole bunch of clauses. Are we sharing all of our money? Is, are people going to keep, let's say, 10% of their earnings in a segregated account? So if she wants to buy a pair of Louboutin shoes and he wants to buy the boys a round of drinks in the bar, if it comes out of those separate funds, the other side doesn't get a veto, they don't get to criticize it. Let's talk about how the marriage will run. If one of them is making a lot more than the other one, are we going to stay in five-star hotels? Are we going to stay in one-star hotels? Are we paying... For, for our expenses 50-50, are we paying in proportion to our incomes? How do we do this in a way that's fair, that we honor each of the parties and we let them move on and they know what to expect? Now, not all lifestyle clauses are enforceable, but this changes the dynamic from one of being adversarial to one of, of working together. Because, of course, my old rule in life and in, in, in my profession is any time a client is surprised, it means the lawyer or the professionals fall asleep at the wheel. You want to avoid surprises. So taking this along for the prenup, if the parties aren't surprised when they get married, that's a good thing. So let's use the prenup for them to share their vision, to share their values, to share their expectations, and set this up not as a, I'm against you, how do I beat you up, but what are we intending to do and how do we keep you protected? Now, and, and, and there's a long subject about negotiation and how to negotiate. If we have a bowl of jelly beans, what process do we use to, to change this? And I don't want to take up a lot of time now, but I have a different uh, video on dispute resolution. But when, when resolving the disputes, always use the touchstone of fairness. I, whenever I'm serving as a negotiation coach for clients, I say, talk to your spouse, say, I want to be fair to you and fair to me. Anytime they float a proposal, ask, is this going to be fair to you or fair to me? And if you use that in negotiating a prenup, the prenup can actually bring you closer together. Use the ideas of principle negotiation, not positional bargaining. And of course, we're, we're now taking a very delicate relationship and we have to treat it carefully. And we have to make sure that we take care of it, that we nurture it, that we make it grow. And that's a party's relationship. If we do sometimes a, a very clever scheme 
to make it work is for the moneyed spouse to deposit a certain amount of money into the non-moneyed spouse's account, not for living expenses, not for household expenses, but just to take care of the non-moneyed spouse. And this is a brilliant idea because every year that the non-moneyed spouse takes that money, she has now again reaffirmed her belief in the prenuptial agreement. She can't come back 20 years later having taken 20 payments and accepted them and now say, wait, wait, the prenup is, is invalid. She can't say, I didn't agree to it. If she's been taking the money all of this time, she's ratified it, she's reaffirmed it. Now the caveat and, and the added benefit is that the, that the non-money spouse can't come back to court and say, your honor, your honor, I don't have any money to live with. The money spouse can say, look, she's got a whole treasure trove of the payments that I've been making all of these years. So it protects each of them. It protects the non-money spouse by, by having their own, uh, having the income that's separate and apart and giving them the security to move on. It protects the money spouse because now the non-money spouse can't claim poverty or they can't live up to, to lifestyle. The caveat to that is if you're going to include such a provision in a prenup, you have to have to have to make sure that you live up to it every year. So just putting it in a prenup is not a magic bullet. The moment you put it in a prenup, you have to make sure you live up to it. If you live up to it, it strengthens your prenuptial agreement. But if you don't live up to it, then that itself, the fact that you didn't live up to the prenup, becomes a reason for setting aside the prenup. So like so much on the law, it could be a double-edged sword, and it could work to make you to put you in a, in a in a bulletproof position. But if you don't live up to it, it can come back to hurt you. So uh, we might want to include survivorship benefits. What do I do? How do I take care of my spouse in case I predispose predecease my spouse? So again, we can use the prenup as a means of protecting my other spouse and and taking care of them. So uh, the, my favorite my favorite uh, article if. It, it, where one spouse looks at the other and says, I'll agree to prenup if you'll agree to non-compete clause. And so, of course, my takeaway from all of this is that you don't just need a piece of paper. You need a wise guide to take you through and navigate. This isn't just some mechanical formula, type 2 plus 2 is 4. You can do more damage to your relationship by asking for a prenup than you gain by having the prenup. But you need a wise counselor to guide you through and take you and understand the psychosocial dynamics of what gets created when you say the word prenup, when you say the word divorce, and how do you take care of that. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. I have a question, Haim. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know with trust and estates, um, uh, you'll oftentimes review through the course of your lifespan um, and make adjustments. Is a prenup considered finite where you um, outline all of the, uh, the negotiation is done, but it's never uh, reviewed again through the course of the marriage um, as a way to either enhance or make timely changes? Is it finite? So that's a great question. And the answer is not really a legal question, but a strategic question. So anytime somebody asks me to sign a deal, it's like, okay, what's in it for me? And so when you come back three years and 10 years in and you say, wait, wait, let's do another one. Well, why should I do another one? So if you do another one to benefit me, of course, but most people want to do another one to benefit themselves, not their partners. So if you, the, the, the difficulty is before the marriage, the marriage itself is the, is the consideration for the prenup. So every contract in order to be, to be valid, you have to have an offer, acceptance, and consideration. Those are the three elements by law. If I promise to mow your lawn every week, every Sunday morning, and you say, okay, we don't have a contract. If, if I promise to mow your lawn every week on Sunday for $20 and you say, okay, now we have a contract because there's consideration. So before the marriage, the idea that we, I promise you, you promise me, the, the fact that we're having a marriage is consideration enough. Once we're in the marriage, you need some other form of consideration. Once somebody wants to change it, the other side isn't going to change it unless they get some benefit. So parties sometimes maybe draft the prenup and they're, 
the, the cases are legion. I've had several where they say, don't worry, don't worry. If we're married for three years, I'll tear it up. Sometimes after three years, they don't tear it up. Sometimes after three years, they tear it up. And there's one case where they tore up one copy, but, she, but one spouse had another copy somewhere. When they got divorced, they pulled out that other copy. And the court said they pulled it. They have, you know, there's a prenup. So it's a strategic question. And of course, the parties are free to do anything they want, and they can make another prenup later, and they can rescind the prenup that they drafted earlier. But, but if one side wants it, why would the other side agree? And, and if you can work that out, where maybe it's the moneyed spouse tells the non-moneyed spouse, let's do an addendum, let's change the prenup, here's another you know, $3 million, and you agree that. And so anything is possible, but like in any business deal, you have to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chaim. Anybody else has any questions for Chaim? Uh, yes, sure, Alfred, go ahead. A little low, but... It's low? Oh. Okay, that's good. Uh, so our prenup, prenuptial agreements, silly question, are they, are they filed in the courts or is that a private agreement? It is a private, it is a private <laughs> agreement that doesn't get filed in court until one side wants to enforce it. Oh, I see. So that's what the courts never see it until... Because I heard a lot of prenup, prenups are not uh, enforced by the court once it, it's unfolded. Uh, like a, a large majority of them, but I see you saying there may be reasons if somebody doesn't live up to the agreement, like not paying the payments uh, stipulated in the prenup, right? But are, are there a lot of other reasons why they don't enforce it? I'm wondering why they don't. From what I heard, you know, they're, they're so we can talk for weeks about challenge. We can talk for weeks about challenging prenup prenuptial agreements. Right. One of the big ones is the night before the wedding, somebody's paid $100,000 for the band and the wedding and the gown and the dresses, and the whole family's flown in, and the spouse walks up the night before and says, here's a prenup sign, and or else I'm not walking down the aisle. I've now that's coercion. That's, yeah, I've heard of that. that's coercion and duress. So there are grounds to set aside prenups, but that's not the rule. If, that's, if, if you walk around thinking that's the rule, you're going to get yourself or somebody else into trouble. The general rule is that prenups are ironclad. And if you don't find a loophole, if you don't find a way, like every other country, if you don't find a way to get out of it in a valid way, and people have spent a lot of money challenging prenups and defending prenups. But if, if you sign a prenup, you've got to assume that it's not, that it's going to be enforced. In fact, if one side is asking for an onerous prenup, that the that's deal that's treating the other side unfairly the best protection you can have if you're treating the other one unfairly is to make sure you're of the other side as a lawyer because invariably the lawyer is going to write that cya letter to the other side saying i am advising you not to sign it and if the client gets that letter and says i know my lawyer is saying i shouldn't do it i know it's a bad idea i'm still signing it when they come back 30 years later and say it's unfair the judge says, you knew it was unfair. You chose to sign it. And so you've got to assume that a prenup is, and if it's well drafted and it's drafted by competent practitioners, it's going to be ironclad. You're going to have a hard time getting out of it. The two things you can't, the one thing you can't, you can't prenup away is custody of children. You can't prenup away child support. Maintenance has to be fair and reasonable at the time when you enter the agreement, and then it has a further look forward period that at the time it gets enforced in court, it can't be unconscionable. But that's not the general rule, and that's specifically in the statute. General rule, you've got to assume that prenups are enforceable. And I am non lawyer, so. Party, doesn't each party have to have their own attorney? That that's better. I would I would counsel every party to get a lawyer because without a lawyer they could say I didn't know, but the other one took advantage of me. But that doesn't automatically disqualify. That's a huge red flag. And if the other side didn't have a lawyer, the judge may look a bit more closely at it. Um, again, if if a prenup is unconscionable, unconscionable is defined in the law. Unconscionable doesn't just mean unfair. Unconscionable means. It is so grossly unfair that no man in his right mind, no ethical man would ever ask anybody else to do it. So it's not just that I'm taking a business advantage of the other one. 
pretty woman. He picks up this beautiful woman on the street corner and says, hey, will you be my date for a couple of weeks? You know, there's nothing unfair about that. And so you've got to be careful. I wouldn't rely on the other side not having a lawyer saying, oh, don't worry about it. I didn't have a lawyer. Doesn't get you out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again, Haim. Great presentation.